we thank you that there is peace, and there is peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that the guilt has gone, and is gone forever. And Lord, we praise you for all of this, and we thank you that we can stand before a righteous God, dressed in beauty, not our own. And one day we will meet thee, and we will meet Christ, and we will meet him not as judge, but as Savior. And we thank you for all of this, and for the great and wondrous and blessed and happy hope that we have. And we thank you for all that you mean to us. Lord, as we draw nigh into thy holy presence, we pray for your grace as we worship you today. And we pray that our worship would be in spirit and in truth. We pray that you would draw very near and draw very close, that we would know your spirit and hear your voice speaking to us. And give us open ears and open hearts for the voice of God. We pray that we would not be deaf to your call. We pray that we would not be stubborn in resisting your call, but we pray that our hearts would be molded by God himself. And we pray that you would cause our ears to be open. We pray, Father, that you would undertake for every individual and every family that's in your house today. Supply each and every need, we pray. Thou knowest all of our needs, and thou knowest them more than we know them ourselves. Thou certainly knowest them more than the preacher knows them, but yet you can take the words Apply them through your Spirit to every heart. We pray for all those that are sick, all those that are laid aside, who cannot be with us, all those that are infirm. We commit each one to you in the Savior's name. We think of our sister Mrs. Boyd at this time, that she would know your grace to help, know your peace, know your love. And we pray that you would guide the doctors and nurses in their care for her. Pray that you would keep our sister free from pain, and we commit her to you. We pray, Father, that you would undertake for uh, Jim Garland and Pastor McClatchy also in hospital. We pray for those in nursing care. We think of our brother Jim McClung, especially. You've been here to our brother Jim. You will bless him today, and that he would know your grace and bless our sister Lena as well, and for all others. Thou knowest each one that is laid aside, each one in nursing care. Thou knowest each one that cannot get out for uh, whatever reason, and you know all of those reasons, and those, uh, Lord, who cannot come because of difficulties that are beyond their control. We pray that you would be near to such today. For all that are joining us in live stream, we pray that you would speak to each one through your word and through your truth. We pray for the gospel as it will go forth today. We pray for all of our sister churches and for all faithful servants of thine who proclaim Christ, that you would undertake for the going forth of your word, that precious souls will be ushered into the kingdom of grace, and that your people would be encouraged in the things of God. We pray, Father, for revival in our land and our nation, for turning to you and a turning from sin, turning to the God of glory, a turning uh, with conviction for the failures to keep your law and to dishonor your word. And we pray that you would be pleased to uh, turn us to you, uh, that we will know your help in our, in our service for you in these dark and bleak and wearisome days. We pray, Father, that we have this great message. May it catch fire in our souls and our hearts. Jesus Christ lived and died for me. We pray, Father, that you would uh, undertake for the meetings at Martyrs. We pray for the convention tomorrow, that you would bless the ministry of your word there, and that your people would know your presence, and that you would do something there that would cause even a, a blessing to cascade out round about our churches and round about our land. Lord, we pray that you be with us now. Bless us as we continue to worship you. May our worship would be in spirit and in truth, for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. At this stage, we'll just move on to the next hymn. Hymn 120. Thine be the glory risen, conquering Son. Endless is the victory thy o'er death hast won. Angels in bright raiment rolled the stone away, kept the folded grave clothes where thy body lay. And then we'll have the children's address after this hymn. Thank you.
This stage, I'm going to bring a talk to the boys and girls. And today, boys and girls, I want to talk to you about one of those animals that we think about when we think of the Easter story. And we think of Christ's death and resurrection. And of course, that's a donkey. And donkeys are creatures that I'm sure you have perhaps had a ride on along the seashore. They used to be a great favorite, getting a ride in the donkey along the, the seashore at Port Rush or some other seaside resort. But I got thinking about donkeys in the Bible and what the Bible has to say about donkeys. Well, God, of course, made the donkey. So the first donkey was whenever God made the heavens and the earth. And then there was a donkey that was in the ark and was brought out of the ark in order that there might be more donkeys. And of course, that was really important. And then we have the donkey that talked, Balaam's donkey, and that was the donkey that spoke. And then we get to the New Testament, and the New Testament, well, at Christmas time, we talk about the donkey that carried Mary to Bethlehem. I don't know if that was the case or not. The Bible doesn't say, but we don't really think that she would have walked all of that distance, and a donkey was a great means of transport, so probably Mary did come by donkey. And was there a donkey in the stable when Jesus was born? Perhaps there was. And where there would have been animals kept, well, usually there were donkeys, because donkeys were really useful. Uh, nowadays, when your daddy wants to clear some stuff out of the house, he, he puts all the stuff in the trailer, and he goes off to the, the skipper. Maybe he gets a van. But in those days, if you were going to carry something, you got a donkey. A donkey was your van. Your donkey was your trailer. And so the donkeys were what we call beasts of burden. They were there for, for carrying things, and they were very, very useful animals. And they were much better for that than horses, because horses would easily stumble, but a donkey, very strong, keep its balance, doesn't stumble or fall over. And donkeys can carry enormous weights. And in some parts of the world today, donkeys are still used for that kind of manual work. And then we have the donkey that we're going to talk about today, the donkey that carried Jesus into Jerusalem. And that took place one week before he rose again, what we call Palm Sunday. And Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, and he sat upon a donkey. They were told something about this donkey. It was a young donkey. Nobody had ever sat on this donkey before. And the disciples went into Jerusalem to find this young donkey, and it was tied up. And they said, the master needs him. God needed this donkey. Jesus needed this donkey. And it was tied up before it came to Jesus, but when it came to Jesus, it was loose, it was free. And then the donkey came to Jesus, and Jesus sat on it. Now, normally, If anyone sits on a horse or a donkey that's never been sat on before, never been trained to sit on, it would throw you off. You have to break it in. But this donkey never threw Jesus off, because this donkey knew that somebody very special was sitting on its back, somebody that loved it. Did the donkey really know that Jesus was on its back? Well, I was just reminded of this this morning. I'm very glad this gentleman told me this story that that, that he was reading. See, during the 1904 revival in Wales, little ponies were used in the pits in Wales, down in the the coal pits. When they they mined the coal, the, the little ponies were down there all of the time. And some of those little ponies, they never saw the light of day. And they were in that pit, and they, they, they pulled the, the great carts of coal. And the coal miners would have cursed and swore at the ponies to tell them what to do. And then, during the revival, all of these men get saved, and the ponies would no longer do what the men told them to do, because the men were no longer swearing. And so, the ponies had to be retaught because the men spoke a new language. The ponies knew there was something different about the men that were looking after them. And of course, if somebody's cruel or nasty to an animal, that animal knows. 
So here was Jesus sitting on the back of this donkey. And yes, the donkey did know that Jesus was carrying it. He knew there was something really special about this man. And he did whatever Jesus wanted. And the Lord needed this donkey. And the donkey did whatever the Lord wanted and carried him into Jerusalem. But there's something very special about a donkey that no other animal has. A donkey has a cross on its back. That's very strange. Why has the donkey a cross on its back? Scientists and people who study animals don't know. They give you reasons, but they don't know. And they have to admit they don't know why the donkey has a cross on its back. And then some people told this legend, which I'm sure it's not true, but it's an interesting story, that the donkey that carried Jesus into Jerusalem went to the cross, and the shadow of the cross fell upon it, and the shadow was left. Now, I don't think that's true. But I know this, that God put the cross on the donkey's back. The donkey was chosen by God to carry Jesus into Jerusalem, and at the end of that week, he would die on the cross. So God must have had some reason for putting the cross on the donkey's back. He had to have. But what did the donkey do? It carried Jesus. And donkeys didn't only carry burdens, but they carried kings. The donkey was the creature the king rode on. And so Jesus was coming into Jerusalem as the king, but as the king, he was going to the cross to die for us. And something else about this donkey, as Jesus was being taken by the donkey into Jerusalem, he was being taken to the cross. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, if we are to follow him, we have to take up his cross and follow him. Now, Jesus was hated. He's hated by the Jews. They wanted to kill him. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, because the world hates me, it's going to hate you. And we shouldn't be afraid to be different as Christians. Never be afraid to be different from the world. And if people don't like you because you're a Christian, well, that's good. Because you're going to be different. You're going to do different things and say different things and have a different kind of language. And that's what it means to take up the cross. Being willing to stand with Jesus Christ and do what he wants. This donkey did whatever the Lord wanted. Are we willing to do whatever the Lord wants us to do? Remember, the donkey was tied before the Lord got it. And if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, you're tied to your sin. But whenever you know the Lord and follow him, you're free. And you'll only be free when you're doing what Jesus wants us to do. So it's only a simple donkey, but it teaches us so much about what it means to follow Jesus and to serve Jesus and to live for Jesus. As I say, I don't think the shadow of the cross was putting the donkey's back at Calvary, but God put the cross on the donkey's back. And the cross should be in our hearts because Jesus died for you and he died for me. And then he rose again. And that's what we're thinking about today on Easter Sunday. I trust God will bless these few words to your heart and to your soul. Again, a word of welcome. It's really good to see you today. And uh, we bid you warmly welcome in the Savior's precious name. We trust God will, will bless you. Um, do remember the service tonight. Um, tonight's, do you remember the service tonight? Um, we're going to be thinking of the seven uh, cries of Christ from, from the cross. And so that's what we're going to be thinking about tonight. And I, 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 I preached on this some, some time ago. Um, in fact, shortly after I came here, I spent seven Sundays preaching on the seven cries. But we're going to do it all in one service, and we're going to do an overview. I think there's nothing shows us so much about the Lord and his heart and his spirit as he hung on the cross as the seven sayings, the seven cries. So do please come along tonight for the gospel service. And that will be preceded by the season of prayer. And then on Wednesday, um, 
Uh, and then on Wednesday evening, we'll be having our midweek Bible study and prayer meeting. We encourage you to get along to the place of prayer. And on Friday, Presbytery uh, for our elders, and that will be in Lisburn. The Easter Convention meetings take place this weekend at Martyrs Memorial. Dr. John McKnight from the United States of America is the guest preacher. And that service on the Ravenhill Road will be 7 o'clock tomorrow evening. And I'm sure that will be very beneficial, very helpful for you. If you can't get along, you can tune in on the live stream. Next Lord's Day, the service will be at the regular times, and it is communion next Sunday, so do please remember that. Also next Sunday, the covenant giving for the uh, work of Christian education, also for missionary work, will be received. And do please uh, remember the Let the Bible Speak TV recording night at Lisburn. Um, if you can come, and we need some people to come, uh, there's a sign-up sheet. Um, I've sent it out online, or, or if, you're, if you can't get at that, just say to me that you'd like to come, just so we can take a note of the names also for catering, for we arrive at 7.30 for tea. That's Thursday the 11th. Do please take note of the ladies' outing, Sunday school excursion, and remember to complete the various sign-up sheets for that. The ladies' fellowship, Monday week, our sister Vi Dawson from Randallstown will be the special speaker. Uh, we'll be having our month of testimonies in May. Do please pray for them. We'll be talking more about them as the time gets closer, but we always look forward to our month of testimonies. There's an opportunity to invite others out under the sound of God's Word. And do please remember all those that are sick and laid aside that they will know God's grace and God's help in their own situations and circumstances. Uh, let us have another hymn, hymn number 94. So this will be the, the offering hymn. And with no Sunday school, the offering will be taken up uh, at this stage of the service, hymn number 94. Uh, Jesus is standing in Pilate's hall, friendless, forsaken, betrayed by all. Hearken what meaneth the sudden call. What will you do with Jesus? Please keep your seats as your tithes and offerings are received.
Let us turn in the Scripture to the Gospel of John, chapter 18, and we will read from the verse number 28. John's Gospel, chapter 18, we're going to read from the verse number 28. John 18, verse 28. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I on into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Amen. We know that God will bless the, give, the reading of his word to our hearts. Let us seek the Lord for prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you. We thank you for this service. We thank you for the praises. We thank you for the giving of your people. We thank you for your word above all things. And as we consider your word now, and consider this aspect of Christ's life, we pray that our hearts will be touched. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen and amen. The verse 37 of John chapter 18 reads, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Today we're going to think about the king and Pilate's judgment hall. It is said that the Jews, they gave the world religion, that the Greeks gave the world words, but the Romans gave the world law. And of course, there is a lot of truth in that, because the Jewish religion, the Jewish faith, it is the most ancient of all religions and faiths, and indeed, in its Old Testament form, it does lay the basis for New Testament Christianity. The Greeks were great people of learning, great people of logic, debate, literature. But the Romans did something. The Romans introduced a common form of law into the world. And Roman law was very regimented. And Roman law produced a degree of civilization in the world that there never was before. 
And here in John chapter 18, we have the Lord Jesus Christ being tried by Roman law. But he is not just tried by Roman law, but he is also tried by Jewish law, because he was brought before the Jewish Sanhedrin, and that represented the law amongst the Jews. And they could try individuals, but there was one thing they could not do. They could not pronounce a death sentence. Execution had been removed from them by the Romans, and only the Romans could produce a death sentence. So Christ was tried, and he was found guilty by the Jews. But he had to be found guilty by the Romans as well if he was to die. And ultimately, it would be the sentence of Roman law that would send the Lord to Calvary. But of course, it was a total perversion of justice, and it was a perversion of Roman law as well. What was he accused of? In Luke chapter 23, in the verse 2, we have the triple accusation that the Jews brought against the Lord Jesus Christ. And whenever they brought him to Pilate, they said, we found this fellow perverting the nation. That was the first thing, perverting the nation. Forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. That was the second thing. And the third accusation was that he himself is Christ, a king. And it would seem that Pilate was not particularly interested in the first accusation, perverting the nation, or in the second accusation, forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, but he was particularly interested in the third accusation, that Christ declared himself to be a king. And it was this that Pilate focused upon, asking the question in verse 33, Art thou the king of the Jews? And why was Pilate particularly interested in this? Because in making himself a king, he made himself above Caesar. And that gave Pilate a pretext for having the Lord executed, that he had, in effect, rebelled against the rule of Caesar. Pilate is a representative of the Roman emperor. He is the representative of the most powerful man in the world. And before the representative of the most powerful man of the world, Jesus Christ, he stakes his claim to be the king. And as Pilate asks the question in verse 37, are you a king? Jesus answered, thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. And here we have the Lord's confession in Pilate's judgment hall. It was the Apostle Paul who said in 1 Timothy 6, verse 13, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed the good confession. And here we have the Lord's confession, the confession that he indeed is the king before the representative of the Roman Caesar, the king in Pilate's judgment hall. The first thing we're going to notice about this is the splendor of his person. Notice, please, the question that Pilate asked and how the Lord responded. Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. Regarding the splendor of his person, we notice, first of all, dignity and serenity. Whenever you think of what had just preceded, the events of that morning when the Lord was arrested, that terrible night when he was tried before the Jews, it was a night of, of mayhem. The mob coming into the quietness of the garden, taking Jesus away. Judas coming stealthily and treacherously forward to plant the traitor's kiss upon his cheek. The disciples scattering and fleeing in terror. 
And then Peter, following afar off to the judgment hall, and there he denies his Savior with oaths and curses. You think of how they had beat Jesus and how they had brought the most dreadful charges against the pure and spotless Son of God. And then he was taken through the streets of Jerusalem and brought at the early hour to Pilate, the judge, and presented before Pilate. He was facing the cross. He was facing crucifixion. He was facing the most fearful, the most dreadful form of cruelty, execution that had ever been contrived by the heart of man. And yet, he is a figure of calmness and peace and authority. Pilate said, Are you a king? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. This was Christ, in effect, saying, I am a king. What you say is right. In the midst of this maelstrom of hatred and cruelty and perversion of justice, Christ, he boldly stated, his credentials, thou sayest, that I am a king. But I also want you to notice the king and his kingdom. Christ had already, before this, stated what his kingdom was. And that is, of course, what drew the question from Pilate. Thou sayest, uh, are you a king then? Because Christ had already stated it. He had stated it quite clearly in the verse 36. Whenever Pilate said, Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me, what hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. I have a kingdom, he said. My kingdom. Here was the king talking about his kingdom. My kingdom. But it's not of this world. It doesn't belong here to Israel or to Judea. It doesn't belong to any geographical place. It doesn't belong to any ethnic group of people doesn't belong to those who speak a particular language. My kingdom! It's not a geographical place. It's not a place with boundaries and borders. It's not a place guarded by soldiers. My kingdom is not of this world. If it was of this world, my servants would fight for it. But my kingdom is not from hence. And here he was showing us that his kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom I have, Pilate, is more powerful than the kingdoms of this world. My kingdom started in the heart of God. When God chose and predestined a people to be his from before the foundation of the world. And Christ came into the world to claim these people. To establish them as a church, as a spiritual kingdom in the world, a church that would surpass the Old Testament kingdom that was Israel. You see, Israel was in its death throes here. Its death throes as a nation. Israel was fading away as a place of significance in the great spiritual economy of God, because there was going to be a new kingdom, a kingdom made up of Jew and Gentile, a kingdom with one rule, and that was the gospel, with one king, and that is Jesus Christ, a kingdom that would reach into every part of the world, a kingdom that would be bound by the eternal covenant of grace, a kingdom that would be advanced not by swords and arrows and spears and by the footsteps of soldiers, but a kingdom that would be advanced by the preaching of the gospel and by the praying of the saints of God. And this kingdom the Lord was establishing is the most powerful and long-lasting kingdom the world has ever seen. Because the Romans have disappeared, and many great civilizations have come and gone. Nations have become powerful, and then they have faded away. But Christ's kingdom is still in all parts of the world. And in all parts of the world today, people are celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ lives and he reigns. And here we see the 
splendor of his person. Pilate didn't see it, but he would take Jesus, he would crucify him, he would nail him to that cross. His soldiers would do their worst to him, and then he would be taken and he would be buried. But on the third day, everything would change. and There would be no body, and they would discover no body because Jesus Christ would live the splendor of his person. Isn't it good that we're part of that kingdom today? That's our true identity. True authority rests with Christ. And to be part of the church is more wonderful than anything in this old world. Let's also think of the submission to his purpose. Look at what he says next in this verse 37. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world. He was born to be a king. He was born to be the king of kings. And here we are introduced to something very important. The mediatorial work of Christ. A mediator is one that stands between two warring factions and makes peace. Christ is the mediator who makes peace between us and God. And as our mediator, he fulfills three offices. He is our prophet in that he teaches us God's Word. He brings God's Word to us. He's our priest in that he offers himself a sacrifice for us, and he offers prayers for us. But he is our king in that he reigns over us. But to be our king, he had to become a man. He must reign over us as a man, just as he must speak to us as a man, as the God-man, God and man in two natures, one person forever. He must offer himself in the cross as a sacrifice for us. He must rise again as a man for us, and he must make intercession for us at God's right hand, and he must reign over us as the God-man. And Christ reigns over us today as one who was born of the seed of David. He is the lion of the house of Judah. And he came into this world, submitted to this purpose to become man in order that he might be our king. The great question at the very start of the story of Christ's coming into the world, the question the wise men asked, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And here we see him talking about the fact that he was born for this purpose, born to be the king. But as the king, he could only win his kingdom through the shedding of his blood, through the offering of himself a sacrifice. He could only win us poor lost sinners, that we might become part of this kingdom, that we might have God's righteousness by taking our guilt on Calvary's cross. He was submitted to this purpose. John's gospel talks continually about the hour, the coming hour. But now the hour had come. The hour had arrived. Over in John chapter 2, if you want to flick through your scriptures, you'll be able to pick up these references very quickly. John chapter 2, verse 4, Christ said to his mother, mine hour is not yet come. John chapter 7 and the verse number 30. He, he talked about the hour that had not yet come. The people tried to kill him, but it wasn't his time. The hour had not yet come. You come to John chapter 12 and the verse <clears throat> 21. You come to John chapter 12, and he talks about the hour in the verse 23. Jesus said, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So, the hour is now coming. The hour is getting closer. And he talks there about death, but the corn of wheat falling into the ground and dying. Then you come to chapter 13 and verse 1. It's such a beautiful verse. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world. He loved them unto the end. That's the king. That's the king. Loved his own that were in the world. He loved them unto the end. That's how he loves us today. The hour was come. 
His love would be sealed with the shedding of his precious blood. And you come to chapter 17, the verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. The hour has come. And here he is standing before Pilate. For to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world. The hour had come. We see his unflinching obedience to God's purpose. Unflinching obedience. He never went back once. He never shirked from his great duty under the terms of the covenant of grace to die as the king for his subjects. You look at verse 32 of John 18. Look at what it says. You see how Pilate and the Jews, they're in the very, they're in the very palm of God's sovereignty. Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. Pilate didn't want anything to do with Jesus. He tried all kinds of means to put Jesus away. Judge him according to your law, the Jews said, but he must be executed. We can't execute him. Verse 32, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spake, signifying what death he should die. It was already determined how Jesus would die. Already determined. He must go to the cross. He submitted himself to all of that. For this cause came... I enter the world. He faced it all for us. The submission of the king. But then thirdly, the statement he proclaimed. Notice what he said at the very end of this verse 37. That I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. He is the, the great witness. He's the great witness. Truth is the principal aspect of his kingdom. He reigns with truth, pure truth, unalloyed truth, truth that is not alloyed with error, truth that is characterized by light, pure light, truth that reigns in hearts. And those that are in his kingdom, they receive his truth. Do you see that? Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. His kingdom is a kingdom of truth. Now, this was something that was beyond Pilate. In fact, Pilate's words in verse 38 are somewhat sarcastic. What is truth? What is truth? How often is that question not asked today? What is truth? What is truth? What is fact? What can we believe? What do we believe? What should we believe? What is truth? That's the cry of the world. Every philosophy amongst men, it comes and it goes. It's like the mirage in the desert. Truth is never found until men and women come face to face with Jesus Christ and with his claims. And then we discover truth, because truth is only discovered in him. And we have his truth in the Bible. And this is why, as the Church of Christ, as those that are ambassadors for the greatest and the most powerful kingdom in the world, ambassadors of the greatest king that ever was and ever will be. Those that are ambassadors, we need a vision. There's only one message can change the world, change society, and that's the truth. And the truth will set you free. It's the truth of God. Jesus Christ came to bear witness of the Father. He is the Word, the one who declares the Father. We discover God in the Scripture. The truth of sin that this world is a broken place, dying and perishing. Broken. Men need to hear that truth. They need to hear the truth of guilt and what sin does to them, how it destroys, how it wrecks, how it perverts. Dear friend, today, if you haven't come to Jesus Christ, you need your sin dealt with, and only the King can deal with your sin. It's the truth of redemption that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. It's the truth of resurrection. He didn't just die, but he rose again. And it's the truth of the second coming. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. And that's what the world's facing. The coming again of Jesus Christ. 
the king's return. It's the only message, because there is but one Savior. And unless this truth reigns in your heart, you are lost today. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Have you submitted yourself to the voice of Christ? He's speaking today. He's calling. The King is calling. The resurrected Lord is calling. He's calling today from Pilate's judgment hall. He's calling you with truth. Are you going to give your heart to the truth? Over in John's Gospel, chapter 5, the verse 28, the king, he said, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming into which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Pilate heard his voice on this day. The Jews heard his voice. For come a day, everyone will hear the voice. Even those that have died will hear the voice. Those that have saved, they'll hear the voice, will be called to everlasting life. Those that are unsaved, they'll hear the voice as the king summons them to judgment. The voice of Christ. If you don't respond to the king's voice in this life, during this day of grace, you'll respond to the voice in that day, but it'll be too late for your soul. Oh, hear the statement. There only is one truth worth living for, and it's the truth that is in Jesus. There's only one kingdom worth saving, worth serving. It is Christ's kingdom. There's only one king that we can serve with absolute confidence, and it's Christ. Are you serving him today? Let's bow for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for the, the king for his kingdom, for the church he's establishing, the church that is growing, the church that goes into all parts of the world. We thank you for the king's claim and for the king's credentials. Help us to serve him with our all. And for those that don't know you, may there be a turning to the king of kings and lord of lords. Lord, be with us today as we sing this closing hymn for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's sing the closing hymn today. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the pleasures of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I loved thee, my Jesus, tis now. And as we sing, may these words be our own personal prayer of dedication. If ever I loved thee, my Jesus, tis now.
God, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. We pray that we would humbly submit ourselves to him, to follow the Lamb whithersoever he would go. Be with us today. Be with us as we return to God's house in the evening. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be our abiding portion now and evermore. Amen.